find Genesis chapter 37 and let me tell you that I thought about asking Josh to open this morning with this story but he might get carried away and go five or six minutes so I'm going to do it but Kurt Schilling was the very best of the Boston Red Sox pitchers in 2004. The team had advanced to the American League Championship Series to face their bitter rival, the Yankees. And the Yankees appeared to be coasting to a series sweep of the cursed Boston franchise, taking a 3-0 series lead. But the Red Sox pulled off two extra innings victories to bring the series to Yankee Stadium for Game 6. But Schilling, in one of these games, took the mound following a loss in game one, actually, of the series while dealing with a torn tendon sheath. Did you catch that? A torn tendon sheath. Uh, And so he, he took the mound. This was his right ankle. And the doctors had sutured the ankle so that their star pitcher could give the Red Sox at least a fighting chance. But the stitches couldn't keep the blood from soaking his sock during the game. Schilling was still able to deliver a seven-inning outing, allowing only one run and four hits to even the series at 3-3. Boston would blow out New York in the Game 7 on their way to their first World Series win since... Thank you, Josh. 1918 for the radio audience. It's not that pain necessarily takes you out of the game. You can play through your pain and even sometimes still win. Life isn't a game, though. And I've walked and I've talked with people who amaze me at how they can keep putting one foot in front of the other. When you pastor for over 25 years, you hear a lot of stories, a lot of true stories, a lot of painful stories, a lot of stories of God's grace and strength. From the man that told me he was brokenhearted because his wife refused to have children, to the couples that have tried everything but still can't have children, to the couples who have buried children, I've heard about pain that I can only imagine how they feel. Pain is rife in the air these days, is it not? Pain is everywhere. Pain will either define you or defeat you, or you can let God define you and deliver you. And that's why Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. He said, I know what it is to be full and to be hungry, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And and, and pain serves a purpose. It serves many purposes, but for one, it, it serves the purpose of God in sanctifying you, in making you more like Jesus. That's why Paul said, and lest I should be exalted above measure because of the abundance of revelations, A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet or to beat me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I I pled with the Lord thrice, three times, that, that he would remove, that he would let it depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And therefore, I will, Paul said, most gladly boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. There's a purpose in pain. If you're in pain this morning, there is a purpose. We're introducing our series today, Power Over Pain, Lessons on Suffering from the Lives of Joseph and the Apostle Paul. Now, just maybe, I mean, it might be that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be in such a position to address the pain in the world in which she finds herself. Maybe just we ought to, to use another baseball uh, analogy, step up to the plate and come alongside people and share the love of Jesus with people 
and offer hope and help and healing to people as best we can, people who are in pain. I mean, you, you say, well, I just don't know how to help so-and-so, Pastor. How about just some honest-to-goodness sympathy from your heart? I mean, we are living in a world filled with pain. May God help us to be the type of church that hears the cries from people that are hanging on the proverbial cliff instead of the type of church that lounges on the beach thinking everything's fine as long as we're okay. May God help us to minister to those in pain. Now, some of you are thinking this. Pastor, I'm in some pain, but, but you can't help me. Nobody at the church can help me. And quite frankly, I, I don't even know... I guess I do believe God can help me, but he, he, I don't know what he can do about it. You just don't know the pain my family is causing me. Pastor, you don't know how messed up my family is. And after all, Pastor, I see all the other families in the church, and I look on Facebook and Instagram, and none of them have any problems. Everything's going great for them. Well, let me just tell you this message is for you this morning. Read with me in Genesis chapter 37 beginning in verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. At this time, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. You think you have a messed up family? This is a messed up family. In fact... I've not even read the half of it. Let's just continue reading a few more verses, and then I want to tell you the title of the message. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Israel's Jacob's new name. Come, I will send you to them. So he said to them, Here I am. Then he said to them, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go down to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they were a false, well, he Excuse me. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Because of time, I'll stop there, but they don't kill him because of what we read earlier at the beginning of the service. Reuben, the eldest, steps in wisely or, or maybe even selfishly for some reason, but he convinces them to do something else. But while he is gone... They see these Ishmaelites coming, and uh, by the way, the fact that there are, are even Ishmaelites at all was because of problems in the patriarchal family. This family is laden with problems, but they, they decide to sell him, and uh, so they tell their father, look, here's some blood. They put some blood of a wild animal on that ornamental coat of 
colors and they say a wild beast evidently has killed your son and there goes Joseph sold into slavery on his way to Egypt and ultimately to Potiphar's house well I want you to see this morning that there's no situation God does not have control over some of you think but you don't know about my situation I'm going to tell you as Curly said to the judge one time in the three stooges truth is stranger than fiction judgy wudgy I'm telling you this there is some bizarre stuff going on in this family only God could give us his holy word I mean the inerrant infallible word of God and it still be filled with such human error and suffering and pain only God could do that I want you to see firstly this morning and the title of the message by the way is surviving the family legacy and I want you to see the pain makers in the patriarchs family the pain makers in the patriarchs family number one deceit now this is Jacob his name actually means surplanter or deceiver. He, he, he was the one that sowed the seed of deceit. He, if you'll remember, he wanted the birthright. His mother wanted it for him. And he deceived his father, Isaac, into blessing him instead of his brother, Esau. And by the way, we don't have time to read it, but there is just constant deceit in this family. I mean, Judah and Tamar, for example, in the next chapter, it's sort of a, a parenthetical story in the midst of the life of, Jodas, of Joseph where his brother Judah is uh, de deceived um, by Tamar and, uh, and even Jacob is deceived uh, in this and sleeps with a, a woman that's, Judah's sleeping with a woman rather that is 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 playing the harlot but she knows it is Judah and she sleeps with her father-in-law I mean he's her father-in-law I mean there's some weird stuff going on here this family is full of deceit this family's full of immorality <laughs> need I say more I mean I've just told you about Judah and Tamar and uh, you, you have Judah thinking he can use a prostitute while you have Tamar thinking she can use Judah, her father-in-law, simply to produce a child. You have favoritism. This code is not just, well, this is what Joseph likes and you guys, y'all got your coats when you were his age. No, this was special for Joseph. And you notice, he's 17. By the way, I'm pretty sure you don't have to be a, a biblical Hebrew scholar to figure out that when a, a young man reached 17 or before, he should be out working with the other boys. Amen? But oh no, he's at home and he, he's kind of put his supervisor and foreman, if you will, and he's, he's put in the place of tattletale and he goes out and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 37 that he brought his father a bad report when he went out to see the brothers earlier favoritism and it's so obvious and it's so obvious to the other brothers and they hate Joseph for it and it's not okay well that leads us to jealousy you say oh yeah pastor I know jealousy because Joseph's brothers are jealous of him. Oh, but that's not the only jealousy. I mean, jealousy permeates this entire family. You remember when I read about Billa uh, and Zilpah, the wives of Jacob? You, you say, well, but I thought Jacob's wives were Leah and Rachel. Well, you'd be right. But you see... Leah was jealous of Rachel because Jacob really loved Rachel more. But, but Rachel was jealous of Leah because Leah, I mean, she was having son after son after son after son after son. I mean, she was a fertile lady and Rachel couldn't bear children. And so what did Rachel do? She took Billah, her handmaid, and gave her to her husband and 
had him have relations with her and start having children to catch up with Leah. Well, Leah got to where she couldn't have children anymore, so what does she do? I'll show you, Rachel. And she took her handmaid, her servant, Zilpah, and the same thing. And I mean the jealousy just permeates the family. You say, Pastor, you just don't know the, the pain in my family. You're right, I don't. But I want to tell you, God does. And I want you to see in the life of Joseph that your pain doesn't have to define you. There are so many pain makers in families. There's physical abuse. Joseph is abused by his brothers. He's thrown into a pit and sold into slavery. But perhaps one of the greatest pain makers, at least in this family, is a passive parent. Jacob is the epitome of passivity in parenting. Back in Genesis chapter 35, verse 21, we read about some more immorality. By the way, we don't have time today to, to, to totally discuss how messed up this family is. You're going to have to go study because you want to get out before noon today. This family is messed up, and some of it goes all the way back to Abraham and Sarah, but there's a generational curse, and yet this is the family. I mean, this is it. I mean, this is where God's plan of redemption starts. But even in this beautiful plan of redemption, you have things as ugly as Genesis 35, 21, and 22. Look at it. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land, meaning Jacob, that Reuben went and lay with Billah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. He never did anything about it until his deathbed, he withholds his blessing from Reuben. Jacob is that dad that just kicks the can down the road. Do you know any parents that way? Hey, are you the child of a parent that, that is that way? Are you, or do you know any families that just has a, that have a passive uh, parent? Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4, you can read about him withholding his blessing. We won't do that today, but you can go over there. But Charles Swindoll says, No enemy is more subtle than passivity. When parents are passive, they may eventually discipline, but by then the delayed reaction is often carried out in anger. Passivity waits and waits until finally, when it can wait no longer, it comes down with both feet. When that happens, children are not disciplined, they are brutalized. Passivity not only blinds us to the here and now, it makes us inconsistent. I don't know what the pain makers are in your family, but let me just say this. Some of you are here today, and you, you were listening to me, and you think, Pastor, you just don't know how bad my family is. But others of you, well, this message may not apply to me today. My family's so great. I mean, I can't ask for a better mom, better dad, better spouse, better kids. I mean, everything just seems great. But I want to tell you, if you're honest, there are some paint makers in your family too. There is no perfect family. Now, let me ask you this. Where is God in all of it? You could say it this way. Number two, the providence of God in the patriarch's family. Well, first of all, I want you to notice God's silence. We don't know this explicitly, but we know Joseph exercised faith that he would one day be buried back home. What we, I believe we can say pretty confidently, God did not speak audibly to Joseph. It, we, I think we can say this because when God speaks to someone audibly, it seems to be recorded in here in the first five books of the Bible or even in the prophets or wherever. And I think we can also say that God used the dreams that Joseph had to speak to him. And those dreams certainly were a blessing and God used them. But, but I want you to think about Joseph in the silence Joseph had to have faith. Joseph had to trust the Lord. I believe in the midst of his adver adversity, Joseph had to hold on to those dreams. The silence of God. You may feel like heaven is silent with your pain. 
But I want to tell you, God has not been silent. And he says to us today through his word, for the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. He says to us, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He says to us, how shall he withhold anything from us who freely gave up his only son? Romans 8, 32. God may seem silent, but he has not been silent. You know, the epitome of suffering in the Bible is not Joseph, it's Job. And I I found this in Job 29. Job says, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were with me, when my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. And he goes on and on and on. I wonder if you're here today and you feel like Job. I remember when things used to be good. I remember when I was in the blessing of God. I remember when God spoke to me. I remember when the word of God came alive. I remember when everything just seemed right in the world and life couldn't get any better. And I want to go back there. But you and I know the rest of the story of Job and we know the rest of the story of Joseph and we know that God makes no mistakes and we know that God is working for his higher purposes. This is called by theologians providence. This is the providence of God in the patriarch's family, even in his silence. But notice God's slowness. We don't have time to look at all the scripture, but let me just say this. Joseph was only 17 when they threw him into the pit. Joseph was 30 when he went to the palace. Now that may not seem like a a long time to you, less than 15 years, but if you're sitting in a prison, falsely accused, he was not in the prison but a, a couple of years or so, but God's timetable is God's timetable. God's providence does not move according to what you want and according to my clock. That's just not the way God works. And I can only imagine that Joseph wondered, Lord, when are you going to do something about this? I I did the right thing. I've, I've constantly done the right thing. It seems to be not getting me nowhere, but getting me into worse and worse situations. But also, notice God's sovereignty. Look at verse 15 of chapter 37. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? That phrase, certain man, is used also of the being with whom Joseph's father wrestled a few chapters earlier. I can't prove it. But that could be an angel. I mean, this is not like, you know, he's on a crowded street in Memphis, Tennessee. He is out in in the country. There's a certain man that can point him to where his brothers have gone. I mean, this ought to show you the sovereignty of God. Now, it's easy to see the sovereignty of God. If you know the story of Joseph, you say, yes, the brothers meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And what that means is the brothers hated Joseph. They sold him into slavery. They really wanted him dead. Joseph went away, suffered all of this. But then God showed favor on Joseph. He went to the palace and he was there strategically because he had had the prophetic dream of the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine, and therefore he could help Pharaoh and his staff prepare for the seven years of famine and therefore have plenty of grain so that his starving family wouldn't die in the famine in the Holy Land, but they could pilgrimage to Egypt, and he, through his prophetic and and godly wisdom, could actually feed his own family. And of course, we know that's the family from whom Messiah came. That's easy to see God's sovereignty in that. But I I tell you, you look back, and even I want you to know, you may be here today, you say, well, I'm glad at this, sir, I'm glad I'm not, don't really have any pain. 
But there could be things happening in your life right now, and I would say there definitely are, and they're, they're of the sovereign hand of God, and you may end up in a pit, so to speak, and you need to be able to have confidence in the plan of God. Finally, notice God's salvation. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, if you want to flip over there. Genesis 50, 20. But as for you, Joseph said to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. This is the providence of God ultimately, salvation. Yes, Joseph's family from the destruction of famine but also your family and my family from the destruction of hell. This is the family. This is the family. These are the descendants of Abraham. This, these are the people from whom Messiah will come. You say, I don't see how that could be, Pastor. I mean, these people are wicked. They're messed up. They make all kinds of mistakes. And yet God used them. And, and, and watch this. I, I want to just show you this. <laughs> God even, we, we're going to study this, but it could just be that it stops here and there's a rift between Joseph and his family and, and, and they, get, they, they get the food, they get the grain and, and the family of God, the family of faith is saved, but God goes above and beyond, doesn't he? Even their family is put back together. Even their family, e there's restoration of relationships even there. And then it goes even further uh, than that. You see, Joseph, almost all conservative scholars agree on this, Joseph is a type or a picture or sort of his life is sort of a template or picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you really read closely, you might find something where Joseph gives a bad report about his brothers. The Hebrew word there means slanderous. It could be that Joseph maybe milked the favoritism a little bit. Other than that, and, and really that's just speculation, but, but other than that, there's no negative recorded about Joseph. I mean, very few Bible characters can you say there's really no clear uh, sin that we could see, see that they committed. Now, we know Joseph was a sinner, but Joseph and Daniel are that way. You just see them, and you, it seems like they're almost perfect. And yet, Joseph is born into this family that's such a mess. And I want you to think about this. There's someone who was truly without sin, and he was born into a mess of a human family. I don't mean Mary and Joseph's family. I mean the human race family. And he was put on a cross and they meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And you and I are here today because of Jesus. But if you trace it back, you and I are sitting here today worshiping Yahweh, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, because of God's plan through the life of Joseph. I don't know what kind of pain you're in, but I tell you this, I know what kind of God we serve. And he, and he will give you power. Listen, you may not be healed of your pain. You may not overcome your pain and that your pain goes away. You may not even understand this side of heaven, what the pain was for. But I tell you, you can trust the Lord you can trust that he loves you. Listen, he loves you so much he sent Jesus to die for you. There is nothing happening to you of which he's not aware. And you know that he is a good God and a great God. And so how do we respond to this? Take shelter in the presence of God. You know what the Bible says? We won't turn to it. But the Bible says right after Joseph went to Potiphar's house, before he was maligned by Potiphar's loose wife the bible says this phrase now god was with joseph 
Let me tell you, if you're a believer in Christ, I don't know what you're going through. God hadn't even promised that you won't go through anything. In fact, Peter said, do not think it strange when you enter a fiery trial. But I can tell you this, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. I can tell you this, you can take shelter in the presence of God. I can tell you this, uh, you can say that I dwell in the, the shelter of the Most High. I dwell in the secret place, rather, of the Most High. And I shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. You say, it's so dark in my life right now. It may just be, if you're a believer, it's true. You're in the shadow of the Almighty. I tell people all the time, my, my prescription verse, my go-to verse, when I talk to someone and I can't really, I don't have the words to say, and, and I just try to be there and love them, but, but I just want to point them to something they can pray, something they can cry, something they can meditate on. I point them to Psalm 57, 1. Be merciful unto me, O God, O be merciful unto me, for I shall hide under the shadow of your wings until these calamities be overpassed. Paul said, I asked, I, I begged God to take this satanic thing that was causing me pain, to take it away and he said to me, my grace, that is my undeserved favor on your life. Paul is sufficient. It's enough for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul said, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong 2 Corinthians 12 9 through 10 what are you supposed to do be confident in the presence and purpose of God think about it Paul got an answer from God we don't always get a, a, a clear answer but I believe he has given us all the ultimate answers you, you see all your questions about your pain may not be answered in this life and I don't even know for sure in the next life. I think so. We sing that Southern Gospel song. We'll understand it better in the by and by. But here's what I do know. All your ultimate questions can be answered right here, right now by this book. All your ultimate questions. All that you really need to know. All that, that you need to anchor your life to. All that, you, that it will take for you to stand and stand firm is in the Word of God. Adversity doesn't ever mean that God is not at work or that he has forgotten you. God is with you. How do you respond? Take shelter in the presence of God and take confidence in the purpose of God. And then here, here's, the, here's the, another one. Serve God wherever you are. You know, we don't get credit for our sin. We, we can't say, well, um, I meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. You see how God used my sin? You can't get any credit for that. That, that. That's a perversion of the sovereignty of God. God may overcome your evil, but he's never sanctioned your evil. God doesn't ordain evil. He ordains the good to triumph in the, in the midst of evil and in spite of the evil. So where are you? Be right with God. Serve God wherever you are. Here's another thought. You can't use your family as an excuse not to serve God. You can't say, well, I would serve God, but you just don't know how I was raised. You don't know what I've been through, Pastor. You're right, I don't know. But I know you can't use it as an excuse. Look at Joseph. Also, no matter how good your family is, you can't rely on your family's faith for your own personal salvation. You can't do it. You've got to have your own You've got to make up your mind about Jesus. You've got to choose this day whom you will serve. Is it just me, church, or do we need to be more aware of and active toward those who are in pain? God's put us here, has he not? God's placed us. He's engineered for us to be here, to be... <clears throat> hey, this is interesting. They, they sold him to those Ishmaelites... And it says they had spices and balm, and they were from Gilead. And that's the first mention, if I'm not mistaken, of the balm of Gilead. They had this healing salve from Gilead. And the prophets of God said, when Israel had gone astray, is there not a balm in Gilead? 
Can you not go get healing? But they were not pointing to physical healing. They were pointing to the need for spiritual healing. Has not God made us, the people, with the word of God and the spirit of God, a healing agent in this world? I mean, we have the Holy Spirit of God and the same Holy Spirit with which Jesus was anointed, with which the prophet Isaiah describes, he's anointed me to bind up the broken hearted that's the application for the church today you say well look I'm glad I'm not going through anything but I'm going to listen to this sermon series power over pain maybe it's that God's calling you to come alongside someone to love someone to bind up the brokenhearted, to just sit and listen and be aware of their pain praise God for the gospel well I'm finished but just listen to this There are many lessons we're going to learn through the life of Joseph in the next few weeks. But if you're here today and you're going through something difficult, you might just need to feel special for a moment. Oh, sure, it could be heavenly discipline for sin in your life. It could be suffering for Christ's sake, for the stand you've taken for him. But it most certainly, whether it's those things or not, it most certainly is God weaving his best into your life. You are special. And it could even be that God's doing something so great that you'll be able to look back. I don't know this for sure, but I think it's possible. And I think it happens. You'll be able to look back one day, whether when you're older or when you're in heaven, And you'll be able to see back there in that pain. You couldn't really see out of the pain when you were there, but you'll be able to look back and God sovereignly made you the linchpin for his plan for what he was doing at that time with those people around you and in your life. What a glorious thing to be in the plan of God. What a blessing if your pain today causes you to draw closer to him and let me say this finally as we close and our musicians are coming what a blessing if you're here today and you're lost and there's pain in your life if your pain causes you to look up and say God I need you what a blessing